All right. Thank you very much, Jason. And um, well, welcome, everybody. It's very nice to see uh, quite a bit of uh, people uh, in, the, in the call. So um, um, I'm here to talk about uh, reproducible learning environments that we uh, use uh, during training, mainly bioinformatics topics at uh, SIB. And this also falls into our general um, philosophy to make to verify, to make our training materials more fair, to be able to more easily share and uh, cooperate with others with uh, our training materials. So my name is um, Geert van Geest. Uh, that's a Dutch name. I definitely also listen to Geert or Gerrit. Um, so I am a trainer at SIB uh, for 50% of my time. I can spend uh, on training. The other 50% of my time, I'm a bioinformatician at uh, the University of Bern at the Interfaculty Bioinformatics Unit. Um, so um, in this capacity, I'm more representing the SIB. So just a very tiny introduction about the SIB. Uh, it's a Swiss-wide uh, institute with approximately 800 affiliated researchers, so all over Switzerland. I think every major university and institute in Switzerland has affiliated researchers uh, with uh, the SIB. Uh, a major uh, commitment of our institute is to provide training in bioinformatics to um, make the, uh, the, the, the Swiss bioinformatics uh, community more proficient in what they are already doing. And of course, to train new bioinformaticians. Um, we do that uh, with a training group. We are with, uh, I think it's about six or seven people all together in uh, the training group that is headed by Patricia. She already introduced herself uh, earlier. And we have all kinds of courses, of course, related to, to bioinformatics. So we have a course on programming, we have a course on statistics, and we have co courses on, on all kinds of different omics uh, analyses. And that's where I mainly do the teaching. So I mainly teach uh, courses related to uh, next generation sequencing analysis or introductions to next generation sequencing analysis, variant analysis, single cell transcriptomics, and a few more of those courses. And that's also the courses where we are now using these, uh, these environments in. So in this presentation, uh, so that I will first give a 30 minute presentation. I, I'm planning at least to stick to 30 minutes. And after that, we will go through approximately a 30 minute uh, tutorial. In this presentation, um, I'd like to give an overview of how we try to implement fairness at uh, SAB training, because that's one of our, our major um, uh, challenges uh, in the coming years and why scalable and reproducible compute environments are a part of this. So if you haven't heard about FAIR before, that's definitely possible. FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And uh, at the training group, we mainly look at uh, with, uh, well, we mainly try to verify, so to make our training materials more FAIR, so people are uh, find it more easy to find it, uh, can access it, access it. Uh, those training materials have an interoperable format and they are uh, reusable. So, for example, also reusable by other trainers. Um, I will also uh, talk a little bit about the technical aspects uh, of having these uh, environment, uh, host, environments hosted, but um, we will mainly, of course, treat that during the tutorial. So, um, already two years ago, um, a group, uh, working group of Elixir published a paper in PLOS Computational Biology about 10 simple rules to making uh, training material fair. So they have set up a nice uh, overview of what kind of rules to, to follow in order to make your training materials more, more fair. So more findable, uh, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. But really in the middle of those 10 rules, and that's mainly the, 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 the big uh, challenge if you're making uh, your materials fair is the ability to share it. We have the idea that if you uh, focus on uh, sharing your material, it's much easier to follow also all these all these other rules. So that's where we're mainly focusing on sharing our uh, training material by making them reusable for trainers, 
reusable for trainees, of course, and to very much welcome contributions. So then we thought, okay, what would be then the best way to share all of this uh, material? So usually uh, a training session comes with a lot of different uh, training material, for example, exercises, presentations, uh, maybe some recordings, uh, data, uh, very often, especially if you're teaching programming or bioinformatics. Um, but you want to have that all together. And where should you store that all together? Well, you, you should store that, or you actually want to store it in the central place. So everything that belongs to a single course is, is stored together. So what you want is a central repository somewhere. You also want to use tools that are common and will not require long-term investments. By that, we mean that um, if you're using a tool uh, that uh, is needed to recreate or to read or to understand the training material that is not used by a lot of people, uh, then it's much, much less likely that somebody else will reuse your training material. So therefore, sharing is limited. Um, by doing that, you're also trying to have some level of standardization, but you also want to try to have some, some level of standardization of how you organize uh, your training material. So for somebody else, it's much easier to find your, your material and to understand what can be found where. Um, most importantly, um, the approach we take is very much bottom up. So in principle, the way we develop our course, at least our course material, is in a way that pretty much everybody, whether you're inside the institution, inside the university or not, or you're not affiliated with anything, everybody should be able to develop and contribute uh, to, to courses. And by uh, also having some level of uh, transparency, um, it's also therefore much easier to evaluate course material uh, on quality. For example, if you uh, can provide statistics on, for example, users rating, and attribution, uh, you can have a much better idea of whether how high quality a certain course is. So we implemented that uh, in a very straightforward way and in a way that a lot of people already are doing with course material. And we try to have pretty much all course material at least approachable through a repository uh, now on, on GitHub. So what do we have in that GitHub repository? We have markdown pages, and those are later rendered into a, a website that, for example, exercises and explanations. It includes a Docker file that explains the, the teaching environment, more about that later. Uh, of course, it contains uh, the PowerPoint presentations. Um, and of course, what is very nice about GitHub is that it's very easy to uh, co-develop uh, course material together and also to uh, let other people give, for example, feedback on course material or give suggestions. So it's much easier to have a real community involvement if your material is hosted uh, in a repository like this. Um, from that repository, um, we host our course material, or at least our exercises, uh, in a course website that is rendered out of these, these markdown pages. That's also very commonly done, definitely not only by us. And um, if we record lectures, we, of course, link to that from our GitHub repository or from the web page to any YouTube or Vimeo uh, recordings. We store uh, different versions of the course for a long time, for a longer time on Zenodo, where it also gets a DOI, so it's easier uh, to find back. It, has, it will get a unique identifier. And from the Docker file, inside the course uh, repository, we can ge directly uh, generate an image on Docker Hub that can be used to recreate the, the environment of the course. Um, the institutional web page, uh, web page still plays a role, but in, well, it, it in, in a lesser extent, I, I would say. So of course, institutional website is very important for um, announcing courses and to communicate with the audience, but the course material is not really hosted over there. No, uh, course material is really outside the institutional web page by uh, using these uh, very commonly used tools. So it's much easier to uh, work on a course with the community. Um, the reason for using these tools um, 
are uh, mainly because it has so many users. For example, GitHub has 73 million users, Docker has 7 million repositories, and so on. So a lot of people are using these tools, meaning that also a lot of people know how to use these tools, or at least can explain it to their colleagues. So it's much easier to work together on something uh, where you use a tool uh, from that is actually used by, by many people and can be used by, by many people. So these, uh, uh, the course website that, that we almost always have for our courses here are uh, GitHub or GitLab uh, hosted pages. Um, nowadays, I guess they become more and more standard for training. A lot of people are using them for training and that is uh, not a coincidence. They're just very nice uh, for, especially for bioinformatics uh, training, I would say. Um, you can develop easy in Markdown. You have many different renderers and, and templates, so you can make them really very nice and fancy with, for example, Jaguar, make docs or any other, other renderer that you can just run automatically on GitHub and then uh, it is hosted for you. And both GitHub and GitLab host those pages entirely uh, for free. Um, so there is really a lot of course material around uh, hosted on GitHub or GitLab. And we have made a list on uh, all kinds of uh, course related to bioinformatics. We have over a hundred now in uh, that repository. So if you're interested in, in other courses that are hosted uh, on GitHub, please have a look at this link uh, over here. And if you, of course, if you want to add courses over there, uh, please write a GitHub issue and we will make sure to add it there. So this is um, an example of such a course website. Um, you probably have seen such a format before. This is rendered in, in MK Docs. So uh, it is all written in Markdown, but it still, it already looks pretty fancy. So you can embed some videos or yeah, for example, oh, uh, I should start with this. So you have, can have code chunks, which is of course very convenient for bioinformatics teaching where people can just copy paste code and, and run it. You can embed videos, uh, other fancy stuff like admonitions. And of course we have the link to, to our repository that is actually providing the material for this uh, uh, website and other material for, for the course. Um, so that's one part of what participants usually see when, when we teach a, a course. Uh, the other part is of course, uh, okay, it's nice that you can have that code, but you also want to be able to execute that code or at least do the, the exercises. And for that, you need some kind of computational environment. And usually that relies on some uh, installations of software, for example. Uh, but what you usually want as a teacher that these environments next to the course material, because actually also part of the course material is uh, that it is reusable and findable by both trainers that maybe want to uh, give, uh, reuse your training material uh, for, for, for their uh, participants. But of course, it needs, needs to be also reusable by the participants. When they have finished the course, they may, might want to redo some of the exercises to refresh their minds. However, um, well, if you have taught bioinformatics before, uh, you might have uh, had some major issues before. If you wanted to install sometimes some very simple software on a local computer of a participant and it just didn't work, uh, I think we have all uh experience that at one point if you have been uh teaching so it can be a big big challenge and in addition teachers often uh require quite specific resources or sometimes they do for example you need high memory for example if you do a single cell transcriptomics uh, analysis usually you require quite uh, a bit of of memory on your pc and not every participant's pc uh, has that amount of memory and if you are, for example, teaching uh, machine learning, deep learning related uh, topics, you might want to get, uh, might want to use a, a, a GPU instead of a CPU. And that's usually also not available uh, on the machines of the participants. So if you think about sharing, reusing a computer environment, nowadays you easily end up with, with Docker. Um, Docker is container software and container is a lightweight virtualized environment. Basically saying you, uh, a container almost is the same as having 
a completely separated operating system from your host operating system, meaning that you might have a Windows computer, but you can run a container, for example, a Docker container running Ubuntu on your Windows computer. So that's quite powerful also because these environments are, are uh, uh, don't require a lot of space. I think the Ubuntu image, for example, only requires 500 megabytes. Um, they're shared quite easily on Docker Hub uh, or even in a text file, a uh, few KB text file as a Docker file with instructions how to build an image. Uh, it runs on most used operating systems on Windows, Linux, and Mac, and it's quite easy for hosting web applications. For example, uh, RStudio Server, JupyterLab. Uh, recently, uh, we have also been using uh, Visual Studio Code uh, as a web application. Um, so they are actually also partly designed for that. So the container software is partly designed to be able to do that. You can develop locally, so on your own computer, but you can host it pretty much on any server that, that runs Docker. So you can develop very small, but then uh, deploy it in on a very big uh, server, whatever you need. Um, then if uh, you're considering this issue where you want to use um, uh, computational resources that is not necessarily available on uh, the machines of the, of the participants, you might think of using, using cloud services like uh, as we do, we are using AWS. That's a very, I think that's the, the market leader for, for cloud services. Uh, what is a cloud service in this respect? It is just, or just, it's an emulated server. So it feels like a, a normal server with a pre-installed operating system. So for example, you can pick a server running uh, Ubuntu uh, or, or any other operating system. Uh, you pay per minute and there are no fixed costs. So you don't need a, um, uh, you don't have any monthly costs to, to maintain uh, your, your accounts, for example. No, you only pay for what you use. And those things, they are super scalable. Uh, so I, in this table, I added some uh, examples of a few of those virtual machines that you can rent at AWS. So the smallest is the T2 Micro. Um, it has only one gigabyte memory and one CPU. A uh, nice thing about it is that it's mostly free and not, uh, and it's not forever, but you can use a lot of hours of this T2 Micro, T2 Micro for free. Uh, it goes up to really big uh, machines uh, up to uh, this guy over here with 12.3 terabyte of, of memory. So this is not disk space, but really the RAM um, and 448 CPU. So this, this, this one is the biggest I could find now. Uh, it's also, of course, pretty expensive. Uh, makes sense, I would say. Uh, for courses, I very often use, uh, use this one. You can, you can vary in all kinds of respects, but this guy has 256 gigabytes and 32 CPUs, which is quite usually enough for a course of between 30, 20 and 30 uh, participants. And that one costs about uh, $1.80 per hour. There are very many, really many types of virtual machines. And there is a nice list where you can search them at this website over here. So if you combine the two, um, that gives you a scalable environment with the cloud uh, ser uh, server, but also a reproducible environment by using these uh, containers. So you can do local testing and development of all your exercises on your own computer or on a small server uh, with Docker. Um, and with that, participants can kind of take home their environments by just giving them the, the image for the container and then they can run it themselves. Uh, it's of course highly scale scalable. You have only these variable costs, so only these costs per, per hour, and you don't have need a long-term commitment. So you can choose, okay, only for this course that I teach one once every year, or once every two years, I am going to need this cloud instance and I'm only going to pay for that. That's that's quite nice, I think. Uh, just to give an idea of, of costs. So I just gave a three-day course and I used that uh, machine that I just mentioned with the 256. Uh, 60, 56 gigabytes of uh, RAM and 32 CPU. Uh, in total, I used for 30 hours times about approximately, let's say, $2, and it cost me $60 for the entire course. I think that's quite, quite reasonable. Um, 
So um, what's the, how we are using it now? We are using three different web applications, depending on the course, what kind of web application we use. Either JupyterLab, usually for Python related um, courses, R Studio Server for R related courses, and Visual Studio Code if you want to use another language or, for example, the command line. So we have this cloud instance. On that cloud instance, we install Docker. There we host the containers. And um, well, and then the, the participants only see these, these web applications. So this is how it looks during the course. The, the participants only need a browser. So uh, they don't need any fancy computer or, or whatever. They need to install a browser. For the exercises, they go to the course page. And for the computer environment, they uh, get an IP address and a port in order to log into either a, their Jupyter Notebook, their RStudio server, or Visual Studio Code uh, web application. So this is how RStudio server looks like, if you haven't seen it before. So it looks like regular RStudio, but then uh, in the browser. So it's very similar as a participant would see if they would have a local installation of uh, RStudio. This is just an example of a screenshot of the uh, container we hosted for our single cell uh, course. Um, so in order to do that, we have created a, a few scripts. Uh, they are available on, on GitHub. They are relatively um, uh, simple, let's say. Uh, we haven't spent much time in making things very, very nice or very fancy. It's really um, relatively low level, but it does the job, I think, quite well. And it also uh, runs quite well without uh, any issues in general. So uh, the steps you take is first, you have to have a list of participants because you're going to create a container for each participant uh, individually. Uh, you start up an EC2 instance. So those are one of those, um, those uh, emulated servers I was just talking about. So you pick one and you start it up. Then you generate the credentials for those uh, participants. So some random passwords and you associate a port to a participant and then you start hosting the container. So you just start up these, these, uh, um, these containers. Just a few tiny words about the, the layout that it's using by default, that's creating by default. Um, it creates three types of shared volumes, two volumes that are shared by all containers that you, that you start up. They are mounted inside a container, uh, inside a directory, directory called slash data. Um, that is shared by all containers. Um, and that we, that's the um, volume we usually use to share data so people can read data from uh, that directory. Slash group work is shared by all containers and all participants can read and write to that uh, directory so they can work together uh, easily. Uh, for example, with group work, the name's all, name already says it. Uh, and there is a directory inside their home directory inside the container and that is shared only by uh, containers that are assigned to the same participant. So of course, usually in most courses, we have only a single container assigned to the same participants, for example, only an RStudio container, but in some courses you want two, for example, you want both RStudio and JupyterLab. Then if uh, participants get those two containers assigned to, to, um, to himself or herself, then uh, this slash uh, home there slash work uh, directory is shared between those uh, two containers. So it find, it's easy to find back files. There's one admin container that has write access to slash data and, and has pseudo writes in uh, the shared volumes. And of course, uh, uh, an X number of containers are started up for the, for the participants. A few words about security. Um, because uh, this is, of course, also a working pro process, and we started to have this really uh, basically uh, set up. Uh, by default, the connections between the participant and the container is through HTTP, meaning that it's not encrypted. So usually in your browser, you see either HTTP or HTTPS. HTTPS, that's an encrypted connection. HTTP is not encrypted. 
So that's therefore that's less secure than an HTTPS uh, connection. So therefore, it's important that if you would use uh, these, these scripts to host containers, realize that you don't store any sensitive data on those containers. Uh, do not let participants choose their own password because in principle, uh, this system is more vulnerable for, for hacks, for example. Um, be careful with downloading executable files. So if there are executable files in the containers and participants want to download them, that they always check inside a file whether it's really the file they actually wanted to have to, to download. And do not reuse the IP address of uh, the same uh, instance. So always, if you start up a new instance, it's better to uh, have a new IP address. And what you can also do to uh, reduce uh, risks is to restrict the IP from which the containers are approached um, by the participants. So for example, if you have uh, an in-person um, an in-person lecture or an in-person uh, training session um, and everybody connects to the same Wi-Fi, then make sure that you restrict uh, access to uh, the containers from only that particular network. How to do that we will see in the in the tutorial some solutions uh, for the jupyter containers it's possible to have a self-signed certificate uh, so then you can have an hps uh, connection or you can bring your own certificate that's also possible um, and uh, in the end ideally you would have a reverse proxy and i am a biologist i am not an uh, it person so if you have any suggestions or help how to set it up it's very much appreciated okay so that was the the lecture uh, luckily it didn't take too long so now it's time for the tutorial so what we will do in the tutorial is just all the basic steps that are required to host a container on on aws so what we will do we start up an aws EC2 instance, we will generate user credentials for the participants, and then we will deploy containers uh, running our studio server. And this whole tutorial is also on uh, this page. I've sent it in Slack already, and I can also post it uh, now in the, in the chat. Are there any questions so far? Hi, it's JP. I had a question and I don't know if I'll be able to cobble it together in a sensible fashion, but uh, here it goes. A few slides back, you were showing N number of containers. Uh, yes, those are each person is having a Docker container assigned to them. Yeah, yeah that's correct. what you mean. Okay. Yeah, and the yeah. Docker container runs the RStudio server or the VS code or the Jupyter lab. Yes. Okay. And, exactly. and then people connect to that via yeah. the browser. Yeah. 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 Okay. And the shared volumes, that would be like something inside a, like you make one big bucket. I guess you're probably going to go through this, but. Uh, uh, yeah. So not in too much detail. So uh, you uh, also, uh, next to containers, you also uh, have uh, Docker volumes that are entirely managed uh, by Docker. Oh. And with these Docker volumes, these can be shared between containers. So you have separate containers for all participants, but the volumes that the, which are managed by Docker, they are shared uh, between the containers. Okay. I kind of get it, but. Well, yeah, you. I think you'll, you'll see most of it at least. Thank you so much. Yes. Sure. Uh, that'd be a good question. Yeah, I had a quick question about uh, how hard or easy is it, and I can save it for later too, um, but how hard or easy is it for participants to get everything done the way you need them to do it? Because we get a lot of participants who are completely novice. It's like mm -hmm. you show them the command line interface and they're like, ah, what is this? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, if you could comment on sort of how it's been working with novice users, it, at the end too, it's fine, thanks. Yeah, sure, no, I can. I, I think I can answer that now. Um, indeed, so these are Docker containers, me, and that also means that if you want to reuse them, you would have to be able to use Docker. 
Um, it's not really rocket science, but I totally agree with you. If you are not familiar with command lines at all, that can be a bit of a challenge. So um, in that case, uh, these uh, containers, they help a lot during the course to get people set up quickly. Um, but if it's a course for, for novices, it always makes sense to give them a, an alternative of, for example, installing the software on their local computer and, and being able to redo the exercises. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Adrian has a question. Not anymore. No. Okay. Then we just uh, continue with the Sorry. tutorial. Uh, oh. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, uh, at, uh, just the time I needed to uh, to ask my my children to to stay quiet for for two minutes. Sorry, uh, <laughs> just a quick question. Um, how much flexible is actually this setup? So, can you, for example, during the, the the course, if you want to install a new package, can you just quickly do it and easily make it uh, available for all the students, or do you need to redeploy mm -hmm. basically virtual? images for all the um, students, the machines for all the students. So there are two ways to do that. So usually the, the environments I use, or at least the web applications I use have, for example, uh, pip and conda installed, and people can also install themselves R, R packages, for example. So if you think, okay, oh, I need this additional package and I need it quickly, I can usually just say to the participants, okay, just run this code to install this package. So that would be the quickest and maybe uh, with, with simple installations, the easiest way. But um, if you uh, stop the containers, these, these, these volumes, they will remain. So they will persist and you can mount them again to a new set of containers. Meaning that if uh, your participants have written their, their data, their, their outputs that they have been uh, doing, uh, to, to, to have, which they have been generating uh, during the course to this work there directory. In principle, what you can do is just stop all containers and set up a new set of containers and mount them to the same uh, volumes. It's actually just rerunning the same code. Uh, then you're all set again. Thanks a lot. Very clear. You're welcome. If there are no further questions, uh, Stefan? <clears throat> yeah, I, I do have one. How much time would you say is required preparatory prior to a course for setting this up? Yeah, uh, that depends very much. Uh, so for, let's say, um, an introductory NGS course where we just uh, ran, uh, for example, an aligner and we ran um, some, some very basic programs, then it's just a matter of installing a few of those basic programs and you're all set. Um, I've also, for example, prepared uh, a course uh, where, for example, Charlotte was also involved in that is very advanced and needs a lot of needed a lot of different R packages and a lot of different uh, um, dependencies. Even installing those inside a kind of clean uh, Docker container can still be uh, quite a bit of work. But that would also be this uh, probably if you would install that on your own local computer, it would be even more more work. So. Um, yeah, it, it depends on how difficult these uh, these installations are. Okay, good. Then we do continue with the tutorial. And then for that, I'm going to stop share my screen. And then I'm going to share my full screen. There you go. Okay, so I have over here the tutorial open and over here my AWS console. So what we are going to do in this tutorial, we're going to, uh, with the AWS interface, web interface, we're going to start with an EC2 instance. We're going to log in to that instance, generate credentials and deploying our studio server. Pretty sure we can do it within these 17 minutes we have left. So if you are logged in into AWS, you might not see these recently visited services, but what we need is a service EC2. In order to get there, you um, go to services and then it is compute and then you choose EC2.
And then you get an overview of your uh, instances. If you're new to AWS, uh, you probably see only zeros here. Of course, I've been using it before. Um, in order to start up uh, an instance, we can directly click this button, but usually I first go to the instances in order to see if you have any instances running, for example, and then I click the button launch instances. Um, so this is going to be the instance we are going to create to host the containers on. Um, can give it a name. I'm going to call it a uh, live side tutorial. And we are just using very basic settings. So I'm using the quick start. We are going to choose a Ubuntu uh, server. So not Amazon Linux, but Ubuntu. It would also run Amazon Linux. Um, but um, I'm just used to using Ubuntu. So that's why I'm choosing it. Um, then we go down. We choose the instance type. And that's T2, the T2 micro type that's already uh, chosen for us. But of course, you can have this huge range of different instances and, and choose one of those over here. I'm going to choose this small T2 micro one. And then you need a key pair in order to log in with SSH uh, to the server in order to deploy those containers. Usually you uh, use a key that you already have, but um, for now we're going to create a new key pair. I'm going to click this button and give it a name. Uh, live site tutorial. And I'm going to keep the rest as default. And now it immediately downloads the PM file that I will require to log on to the server later on. Um, now that I've downloaded it, I will directly change the permissions, which is required by SSH to log on. So I open the terminal and I am going to type like what's written over here, change mod 400 and my key is in downloads and how did I call it again? Lifecycle tutorial. PEM. So these permissions are just a security um, requirement that's needed by SSH in order to log in later on. So I've done that. Then network settings. <clears throat> so in order to just log on to the server, you only need uh, the SSH port to be open, but we are going to host the containers through individual ports on the server. So we have to open those ports as well. In order to do that, I click edit. And then I am going to add a security group rule at the bottom. So we're here at network settings. I go to the bottom of network settings and I click add security group rule. And this is also the place where you, for example, uh, limit the IP addresses that can log on to the server or actually that can approach the server. I'm going to uh, not do that for now, or at least I'm going to open it to the world. And you also see a warning that it's, that it's a bit dangerous because everybody everywhere from the world now can approach the server. For now, because server is up only uh, half an hour, I'm not going to uh, worry about that too much, but you can also specify your own IP or specify an IP range. Um, then, what we have to specify over here is the port range through which the containers will be hosted. We are going to use port 9000 to uh, 9010. So we're going to open those ports. Uh, that's it for the security groups. And the default is to have only eight gigabytes of storage available. Um, we have um, we can use up to 30 gigabytes and, and still host it as a free uh, instance. So let's just go for that. So we choose 30 gigabytes over here. So we are sure that we will maintain enough disk space. And that's it. So then we scroll all the way down and we click launch instance, which will start up the instance. Uh, could you pause for a second and go back to the network settings? I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, oh, I probably, well, what I can do is just go to the uh, thing again. So 
network settings. You hit edit. Edit. Mm -hmm. edit. And then add security group rule. Okay. And then we can add a second rule. So the first rule is about SSH. So port 22. Uh -huh. So we can actually approach it through, through the command line with SSH. And the second one is, well, whatever you specify. And we are going to specify custom TCP um, from anywhere. So any IP can approach it and then port range to 9,000 till 9,010. Thank you. Yeah, great, good. So I'm going back to my instances again. And now I see, so I have still an instance from the course I gave um, uh, last three days. Uh, I stopped it uh, in order to just just keep it if, if participants still want some information out of it. So that's why it's still there. Uh, otherwise, uh, if you want to totally get rid of it, you terminate it. We will go, uh, uh, I will show you how to do that uh, later on. But the uh, instance we just created, we have just created will be this one. So we gave it a name um, and it is a T2 micro instance. In order to get information about this instance, you just click on it and most important, information about is usually at the first tab. So for example, the IP address that you can use to actually approach uh, this, this server. Um, so that's the IP we're going to use to log on to it with SSH. So in order to log on to it with SSH, in my terminal, I'm going to type SSH minus I, and then the user or then the, uh, the key file. So it's minus i is the option for the key file. And then the username and the default uh, user with uh, sudo access is Ubuntu. And at the Ubuntu machine, let me just make this a bit bigger. And uh, we're going to log on to the public IP address as the host. Then you get a message. Um, I haven't seen this fingerprint before. Uh, do you want to add it? Uh, that's also a security measure by SSH. And then we type yes. And then we are logged on to this uh, EC2 instance. So we now have created our, our own uh, cloud server. Um, Ronzi Ubuntu has all the frequently used uh, tools already pre-installed like, like Git, um, like, like all kinds of other command line tools, grab or whatever. It hasn't got this, at least this instance hasn't got installed, uh, hasn't installed Docker yet. So we have to do that ourselves first. Uh, in order to do that, I have provided this code snippet in the tutorial. So it gets an SH uh, file, a shell script from docker.com, pipes it to SH that actually executes that script and that installs Docker for you. Then you change uh, Ubuntu as a um, root user for, for Docker. And, and that way you don't have to type sudo before Docker. And then you start up the Docker server. So the daemon process, it actually runs Docker. This takes a few minutes. Or one or two, something like that. Shouldn't take too long. So you see actually the shell script being executed over here. So after this, when Docker is installed, we need to log out and log in again in order to use it without sudo. So let's do that. I'm going to type exit. So I'm back to my local terminal and then I'm going to log in again. So just by uh, pressing the key up, I get my command back and I log in again. And I can test whether Docker is there. And yes, it is there. So in order to use the scripts that we have created in order to host those containers, I will clone the repository. Oh, I didn't want that. And 
um, for so usually what you have is of course a list of uh, participants. So, uh, but we have created or I've created uh, just an example list for you. So that list looks like this. Uh, it's in the repository in examples. So just a list of three different users with some very nice Dutch names. Um, so that's, that's the only thing you need. So you need a tab limited file with first name and last name. You need nothing else. Then we're going to generate the credentials for the participants by using the script generate credentials. So that's also in the repository. Minus L option specifies the user, user list. Uh, minus O, the output directory, I'm going to call it credentials. The P, the port start. So these are the ports we just specified when we created the, the instance. So it will start the port. So uh, the first user will get port 9001 in this case. Second user 9002, third user 9003, and so on. And minus A, we specify the IP address of the server we, we're working on. Um, and, and that is used to create links later on for, for the uh, participants to click on. So it will just create those links for you. And we run that, runs very quickly. It creates this uh, directory credentials with some files in there. Uh, the input for Docker start. So that's the input Docker uses. So it just creates the, the port, uh, the username and a password and the user info contains info that you want to communicate to a user. For example, the link they are going to need to log in and also the password they are going to need to log in. Okay, then we're almost there because now we can actually start up the containers. So I'm going back to the base directory of the, re of the repository. And we, are, we have a few scripts in place. We have run Jupyter Notebooks, run our studio server, run VS Code server. Well, the names already tells you. With run Jupyter Notebooks, you start up a Jupyter instance with run our studio server, our studio instance, VS Code server, a VS Code instance. So we are going to start up an our studio uh, instance. So we are going to run run our studio server. Uh, in order to get the options, just just type minus h and you get a, some documentation about this, um, this script. Uh, so minus i would be the image name. So usually you create an image yourself based on a base image. In this case, uh, use a rocker uh, base image for RStudio. If you have developed containers or images uh, based on R before, you have seen this one probably before. It's the most used base image for R-related containers. Now we're just going to use the base image that's on uh, Docker Hub. Uh, minus U, so that's the, the user input file. That is the output that we just created by using generate credentials. And that would be the input of Docker start. P would be the password for the admin container. Well, I'm going to use something very easy, admin password. Minus M would be the maximum memory. Default is 16 gigabytes, but we have only a one gigabyte instance. So we are specifying one G and the, not, the maximum number of CPU will be one. Now it's downloading automatically the, uh, the RStudio image. And we are, I think we are just going to make it before the end of this meeting. So downloading usually goes pretty fast. So uh, maybe it's nice to know that these options minus M and minus C are quite convenient. So with that, you restrict the maximum memory usage and CPU usage per container, meaning that if a participant goes crazy and really allocates a lot of uh, memory to a certain process, it is, will be limited to 16 gigabytes. Uh, okay, now the containers are there. 
Docker container LS. So we have four containers, three for the participants, one admin container. And you see also here the associated ports and where they are based on. So if we go to into the credentials directory and have a look at user info, you see these links. So this is what you communicate to the participants. Let's say we are using this participant link over here. Just copy paste it into my browser. And now I of course hope yeah, that it works. <laughs> Luckily it does. Um, default uh, username for our studio will be our studio. And the link or the password will be this guy. I already see this warning, right? The connection is not secure. Logins enter could be compromised. And that, that is the, the case. So be a bit aware that participants don't use their own passwords, for example. I'm not going to save that. And we have our, our studio server hosted on AWS. That's it. Okay, thank you I so hope much. I hope some people managed. <laughs> Uh, at the end might have gone a little bit uh, fast, but uh, I guess with the uh, with the tutorial you can uh, quite easily redo it, and of course this will all be on YouTube.